Hi guys, welcome. Uh, I'm really excited that everybody's here and thank you for basically all my friends and family for showing up. So that's really great. And I'm gonna just uh, lay this out really simply. So first of all, I'm Tan Maya. And for those who don't know me, but I think everybody on here does with the exception of maybe one or two people. And then uh, secondly, I live here in Lake Oswego, which is in Oregon, and I'm also the director of One River School. And I want to thank Selena for hosting this. Thank you so much, because it's quite an honor to have the Festival of the Arts and Lake Oswego, as well as Lakewood Center, support this event. And they are doing a whole series of these, so I would encourage you guys all to just keep tabs on what they're doing. It's a really interesting art center and there's a lot of dynamic stuff happening there on a regular basis. Uh, so I'm going to break this up into, let me just show you here. So I'm gonna break this up into three different sections. So we basically have about 45 minutes here to talk, which is a very rare occurrence. Um, and the first we're gonna go through just a brief overview of like who I am, you know, what I do, why and how. And then I'm gonna move from past work moving forward to present. And then we're gonna pause on the present, which is my most recent body of work, which is the COVID rainbow series, which Selena has also featured. And then we can talk briefly about what's next. And also we're gonna open up for some Q and A after that. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I was born in Washington DC. And my father, who's here, uh, is a lawyer, but eventually segued into more art law. And my mother, an entrepreneur, designer, maker. And in Oregon, she would have been very much uh, appreciated being a crafts person to, to say. Uh, in New Mexico, I always saw Santa Fe as a really beautiful place to grow up because to me, space creates opportunity. And there, there is just so much quiet and I grew up outside of the main city and that really helped me, I think, tap into some deeper parts of myself, which otherwise I don't think I would be able to have tapped so easily. I also, in terms of my education, I see it in three different sort of sections. One is, of course, sort of more of the epigenetic side of things. So family, as my dad just pointed out, we grew up with a lot of art around our house. So I was constantly surrounded by beautiful artworks and I think that definitely influenced my work. Secondly, is just the community at large in Santa Fe. They have the most galleries per capita in the world, which really makes it an inspirational place to be. Now, of course, that art ranges from what I would call suitcase art, which is you know, your Indian art that you can like put in a suitcase and take home really quickly and then really high end work. And it's a really nice range of uh, different art types that you get exposed to there. And then from the last section there for me from an education stance would be travel and more formal education. And I really wanna focus on starting with uh, Alex Shundi who opened a grad school in Santa Fe when I was in my late teens. And before this point, I had always seen that drawing needed to precede painting. To me, uh, I would not allow myself to really draw that, I mean, to paint that much. Uh, I wanted to really master drawing first because I saw it as such a fundamental skill. And I then got accepted into this school with Alex. So Alex was a professor at Yale and actually opened his own little grad school. That's normal, Selena. And opened his own grad school in uh, Santa Fe. And I went there and Alex really challenged me more than I had ever experienced before in terms of pushing me and questioning and not allowing me to get away with um, just being lazy, really. I mean, he would literally look at my work and he would say to me, you can do better than this. And it was that kind of voice that I then took forward with me in my career. 
Uh, after this, I did go to the Kansas City Art Institute for a brief period of time, uh, but for personal reasons, didn't stay and ended up then at Saatchi in Florence, which was a wonderful opportunity to spend the summer in Florence studying painting. Despite being in Florence, I actually did more abstract work while I was there. So I was really into more collage oriented work. Uh, large drawings and more abstract painting. And already I could feel myself starting to shift in some way. And at this point, I was supposed to go to George Washington University, at which time I called my father and told him that I wanted to defer for a year. And could he send my backpack to me? And I took off and I went to Nepal and then I went to Thailand and eventually India. And it was while I was in India that I set up a studio space. And there I had a very, I had very large canvases, so six feet plus. And every single day that I approached the canvas, I came to it with whatever emotional state I was in. So, you know, if I was feeling happy one day, great, that's what I would paint. And I didn't care about any of the technical elements. I was just sheerly immersed in the process of the making of it. And therefore, like the outcome was really irrelevant to me. And I also saw that as a very unraveling piece in terms of deconditioning myself from all the technical stuff that I had previously learned. So, I'm gonna just share with you a little slide. If it works, give me a second. So, so this here, I know my father can recognize this work. So on the left-hand side, we have a John Claghorn and on the right, a James Davis. So. These works are roughly four, five feet by four in that proximity. And to me, I had this perspective shift where I grew up with these works in our house and I constantly saw them. And originally the claghorn to me was the good work. It was the work that I thought was, you know, art. I, I didn't really think much of the Davis. In fact, I thought the Davis was far beyond that. And, um, and it just didn't appeal to me. And I, I looked at the Davis and I thought, oh God, the proportions are off, you know, the perspective, all of these things that I thought would have made a good piece of art. And that is when I started to realize that no, it's not about the, the technique as much as it's about creating a really powerful evocative image that hopefully helps, you know, do something for the viewer and take them to a further place. So at this point, then I ended up in New York going to NYU and I was studying art and architecture and I was also going to nutrition school at the same time. And I did a short stint in Paris and did art and architecture there. But most importantly about my time in New York, was one of those, another little defining moments where I went up to upstate New York and Alex Shundi, who I had studied with in New Mexico, had closed his grad program and was now living back in New York. And I went up and visited him. And I showed him all of the abstract work that I had done while I had been in India. And there were some, you know, maybe muddled figurative elements in it, but nothing that was at all defined. And I remember Alex just looking at me and saying, Tanmaya, out of everybody that I know, you know how to draw people. And what are you doing? And, he, and I, you know, and at first, you know, I, I, I was a bit insulted. You know, I was like, wait, I'm like, you know, trying to kind of break out and do my own thing. But upon greater reflection, I realized that he was actually right. And it helped me then gain this other level with my work. And I consider this point is like my finding my balance, which is looking at 
the combination of my head and my heart. And I saw the abstract work as being very heart driven. So to me, it was very fluid. It was very feeling based. Whereas the more concrete work, the more technical work was very head driven. And when I was able to, to put these two worlds together, it almost felt like an integration for myself as well. And so that's how my work is kind of arrived at the style it has today. And it has these very hyper-realistic elements as well as these more abstracted elements. And I still see um, technique as being really important uh, and mainly because I just love it. And I love the act of drawing. I also, you know, studied, I did my master's at, in Australia and a lot of other education. And my education spans from art education to like yoga and coaching. And people who might look at my resume and be like, why are, you know, was she digressing in these areas? And for me, no. I always saw that I wanted to become the very best creative machine possible. And in order to do that, I believe that you need to actually have a balance with all of these different areas in your life. You know, you need to be able to take care of your body. You need to be able to eat well and all of those different components, as well as be able to communicate with others. So coming back to my little slide here. So then my personal guiding principles are as follows. I see my art as a series of good decisions executed through discipline and driven by passion. And what I mean by this is that I don't really see that discipline can be without passion and passion can be without discipline. To me, passion without discipline is just goes into the ether and discipline without passion is I think just boring. So I really like to think of the mirroring of these two and that to me has been a really strong force and why and I do what I do. So my why for creating uh, is really pretty simple. I just want to inspire people. Uh, and it's simple, but it's really important. So why I say it's important is that having fellow creatives on this uh, Zoom who can probably relate to this, there are times when you don't really know why you do what you do. And you're wondering, what's the point? No one seems to care. And then you have to come back to that beacon, that reasoning of like, oh, this is why I'm in the game. And this is why I do what I do. The other why for me is also the inspiration I have around me. So a lot of what drives my work is I'm really interested in people. I'm interested in the human condition for better or for worse. And that also is a very huge guiding light for me. So how I create, um, I create in isolation, which I think for my dad visiting me sometimes bothers him because he's not allowed in my studio. <laughs> Um, so I, I create all of my work, uh, in isolation until it's done. So that means no one comes into my space. Uh, I do that for a few different reasons. One of the big reasons I do it is because first of all, I think I'm probably a pain in the ass to be around when I'm really hyper-focused. Secondly, is that I feel it's empowering to be able to make my own decisions and solve my own problems. And I think when you're in a space by yourself, that happens. And it's after I do finish a body of work, I always encourage people to give me feedback and I do integrate that and usually apply it to my next series that I do. Um, I also went through a period where I created for like eight to 10 hour chunks of time with just earplugs in. So I like wouldn't listen to music or have fun or do anything. It was just very serious. And um, I definitely moved very far away from that. In fact, uh, it's very rare now that I don't create whilst listening to like music and just having, making it the most enjoyable um, process that I can possibly do. And I think that also gets reflected into the work. Uh, and then I also work on a body of work at one time. So that means that I'm working on a whole entire series with a set color palette 
uh, at the same exact time rather than uh, working on individual like pieces one by one. I, I work like almost systematically with my work. Here are my lovely little materials. This is my material cart. So <clears throat> in this lovely Ikea cart, which a lot of artists have because it's so functional and great, uh, about 10% of these I probably use. And I primarily use a uh, colored pencil, a little watercolor and acrylic to do my work, sometimes glitter as you'll find out. And I have found that that medium I've chosen because I did my masters in painting and oil specifically and was finding myself having uh, adverse responses to the oil. So uh, upon leaving grad school, I had I basically was like, okay, well, what can I do here? Um, what's my objective? Well, my objective was I wanted to still sell work at a higher price bracket and works on paper don't sell that way. So how am I gonna make a work look like a painting that's not a painting necessarily in totality and still obviously have some of that painterly quality to it um, and obviously be less toxic for me as the creator. So now I'm going to move into my what, which is going to be about my work. So we're going to, I'm going to pull up my website and we're going to talk about my work specifically. Okay, cool. So I'm starting, um, I'm going back in time. Feel free on your own to actually uh, look at this work and peruse more. I'm not going to click on individual images only because it will expand and then I'm going to have to get out of windows and stuff and it's just going to be tinkery. So this is uh, basically the first body of work that I did um, using this new medium and uh, on large panels. So these three here are all uh, about eight feet tall. And then these guys down here are smaller works. And I was dealing with a lot of experimentation of overlapping imagery, as you can see with these. The next series of works that I did, uh, again, I think these are roughly like seven feet panels and then these are ovals, so these are smaller, uh, was called Levels of Tolerance. And this body of work, I actually interviewed couples and asked them what their levels of tolerance were for each other, and then created a panel for each couple based on what I found out through these elicitations. And then the work below that you see here are actually amalgamations of the couple's faces. So one, the top half might be the husband and the bottom half, let's say, was the wife, for example. And some look better than others, let's just say, when they're combined. <laughs> uh, this body of work, uh, Countermanding Saturation, uh, is a work that I did that was based off of the notion that we need to countermand all of the saturation that we have constantly from media and so much input. And so these people, are portrayed in like sub layers. And I have some of my models actually here today. Thank you for being here. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, this was a fun work. I experimented with this work by using string in it in terms of like attaching sort of, you know, drilling holes and doing string. And those are certain things that sometimes I'd say worked better than others. Um, in this piece, I think it was more successful and some of the other ones probably not as much. And then here is a large installation I did uh, called Last Supper Family Style. And this installation had a table that was roughly uh, maybe 20 feet long. And then these plinth like structures around it, each structure actually has a little vignette in it. And each vignette has one of my uh, deceased family members in it. And then the uh, acoustic wax represents the blood of Christ and obviously then the sort of spaghetti or strings are the body of Christ. And then these works here were uh, works that were part of that same uh, 
whole installation just on the wall as well. So everybody on the wall was still living. I'm actually going to skip 2013 um, only because I don't have one of my bigger series showcased there right now um, and moved to 2014. So at this time, I was uh, living between Germany and London, and I was really um, interested in the Bavarian landscape as well as just really trying to push my materials more and experiment. So I created these little guys, which I really enjoyed doing. And then that same year, I did a large show in Sydney, Australia. And this series was called English Tea Party Gone Wrong. And the premise for this was that um, everybody in England is addicted to tea. And then they have basically OD'd on tea. And this is the aftermath of that. And so for this series, I actually created all the little um, tea labels and then you know, installed this and cooked tons of scones with my friend in Australia, and then created this huge installation within the gallery space, coupled by these large drawings, which range from, they're about six foot typically um, in size here. And one of the, <laughs> One of the things about this series, as you can see, is that it did start molding. So I did get a call from the gallery who was not very happy with the fact that there were extra cockroaches and a very unpleasant smell in the gallery. So, <laughs> but I mean, this is what happens when you uh, do food art. <laughs> so, and then in 2015, I uh, did this series while back in New Mexico, and this was my Gang 505 series. So none of these people actually have tattoos, just so you're aware of that. I interviewed everybody here and asked them to share with me important things for themselves. And then I created a tattoo based on what they told me. So for example, my friend here, uh, her two dogs were were who she like really wanted featured. And so I had the dogs on her arm, although I ended up spelling a dog's name wrong, but she was okay with that. <laughs> and no one else would know her dog's name is Boo and I wrote Bob, but oh. <laughs> and then um, and then everybody has the Zia symbol, which is the New Mexico flag. And then this little ring that's the 505. So that's the common thread that's shared between everybody in terms of like the gang symbol. On this same vein, I then created my gangsters in onesies, uh, just like, you know, doing their hand gestures. And then of course, low riders. I don't think you could really do a New Mexico justice without a low rider. So this was a fun, a fun series. And one thing to pay attention to is that at this point, my work has gotten lighter. Like there's not that really dark black background anymore. I'm actually starting to show hair too. In all my previous work, I actually intentionally didn't have much hair. And that was based off of the notion that I think hair acts as a veil and sort of distracts from people. And I wanted to like have people in the rawest form possible. And then just making sure I'm not like jumping a year here. And then in 2016, I did Instinctual Feast. And this work was based off of, and obviously a lot lighter, um, just different instincts. And with this work, a lot of people ask me, oh, what does this mean or that? And to be quite honest, I don't even know what half of it means. I just do it because it feels right. And, and then I actually really enjoy hearing what other people think it means. So each one of the panels in this body of work is based off of uh, a different, like this one's pleasure, we have lust, ecstasy, et cetera. So different states of being. And again, you guys feel free to go back and check out all of these. So the same year, I also did a big installation at the Peters Projects in Santa Fe for a fundraiser for animals. And I painted, I have a little video of me like painting the wall for the um, installation. And these here are all of the works 
that, or some of them actually, not all of them that were featured in that. And my dad actually, I think has the horse on his wall somewhere. Uh, so all of these little guys are part of that. And each one of these were animals from their refuge that I then made works of. And then in 2017, I was still working with a lot of the same um, instinctual feast uh, elements there and created this work here. So this work is uh, a friend of mine, Mateus, and he shared with me a story about how as a child, he actually had a baby pet black panther and um, he grew up in Nigeria and he kept it in his barn and um, and he hid it from his parents because obviously, you know, if you were a parent, you'd probably not be happy if your child had a pet panther. And he nurtured it and brought it like to full size. And then finally his dad actually found out and made him give it back. So a lot of people ask what the black space is and that's actually what that represents. But I wanted to stay away from having an actual literal panther in there just because of other connotations that could be associated with it. Uh, this here is part of, um, again, instinctual feast, um, but then they're like my glitter panels. And then these ones down here, I see as less relevant work, but more relevant from just being a kind of turning point for me. So these works were, I was experimenting with how I could integrate both cosmos and you know nature together and so i created this cosmic fur series which actually informed then my work from 2018 which is my cosmic garden series here so in this work i looked at pictures primarily from the 1800s and took certain poses and then created my own version of that and this work is all about the notion of the integration of the garden and the cosmos. And the gold for me is the honey that binds those two elements. And the and that's like, and this is the first series I did, which actually has glitter too. I love these little ducks. They're really cute. Um, so yeah, these ones were really fun to do and um, quite labor intensive as well. And these works will actually be in a show over, um, is it Chehalem? Is that how I say it properly? I think so. Uh, in February, some of these works will actually be featured there. This work was also featured in High Fructose um, as well. And then I just have some drawings uh, from my Bubble Shoot series. And these were fun. I just had this really cool plant growing in my backyard that I felt like needed to be made into an artwork. So I did that. So there's a level of like intentional and then just, oh, this seems great. I'm going to do this. And then in 2019, I started my Sexy Loud series. And this body of work originally was supposed to be the premise was what makes a woman sexy. And I started interviewing my friends and talking to them about what they thought made a woman sexy. And then I kind of just diverged from that all and just created works that I thought were just fun and and strong. And I think that was part of it is because a lot of the underlying theme that they had shared with me was that what makes a woman sexy is really if they're just confident. Um, that was one of the main common denominators there. And this work uh, was very challenging uh, from the perspective that a lot of these larger surface areas, so like all of the orange, for example, in this one here uh, is glitter. And I ended up having to mix huge amounts of glitter and just getting it evenly spread on the surface was, um, was quite a feat. And these works too are the works that are gonna be um, in the uh, Bennett Prize that's coming up um, that I submitted for that too, so. And then these are some smaller works that uh, are part of the same series and kind of, and go with them too. And then lastly, we're going to move to uh, 2020. And I'm actually going to switch out of here so I can share the full images of these because I want to spend a little bit more time on these works. There it is. 
is, sorry, I'm a lot of screen sharing action. So this is the work that I did um, this year. And this work really diverges from obviously a lot of my past work. And I think one of the big indicators of that is that, you know, A, the figures are a lot smaller. So normally I have these, you know, quite large figures that are pretty predominant in the image plane. And also there's much more storytelling involved and I've been a lot more conscious about what I'm actually trying to portray with these. And I started these works back in March when uh, COVID stay at home orders first happened. And I found for myself that there was just so much information coming from the media and friends and this and that, and it felt really confusing. And I wanted to somehow figure out a way to depict all of what I was hearing and try to regurgitate it in a visual way. And so I created this series and this, I'm trying to, hold on, I'm trying to like move so I can show. So this woman, I call my, my oh my, who's over in the corner. And if you like down below on the end of the beach ball is actually, I'll pull up my annotate, is actually the flag, um, the Florida flag. And part of that was because originally um, a lot of what I was hearing on the news was that, you know, kids were partying in Florida and like then, you know, disaster is happening elsewhere. So I wanted a way of depicting that in a nice way. <clears throat> so, so let me just see if I can, having, oh, there we go. Okay, and then there are, and then some of the other elements in here that you're seeing. I'm waiting for my annotate, give me a second here. I guess it's not gonna pop up. Okay, uh, can anybody see my little square <laughs> cursor? Okay, cool. Uh, so then I- It's right in the waves. What? It's right in the waves. Oh, good, thank you. <laughs> I was like, I can't find my annotate. Oh, there it now reappeared. Thank you for coming back. Sometimes that happens with annotate. So I, I chose to have this really like tumultuous water. I wanted something like that because I think that during this time too, one of the things that hasn't really been talked about is a lot of the environmental stuff that's actually been shifting during this time as well as in some ways getting better because you know people aren't driving as much. And, and then I wanted a lot of stuff that indicated the United States. I, when the Black Lives Matter movement really got strong during this time, I decided that the white unicorn definitely had to be black. And then um, as we progressed over here to the island, uh, originally, I in the news, there was a lot of highlight about how certain demographics um, the colored community as well as the elderly population were being um, really singled out and really hit hard with COVID. And so I chose to like create this, almost like this island of isolation. And then weirdly enough, after I completed this character here, uh, the George Floyd incident happened. So it became even more apt to uh, be showcasing um, that individual. So then here we also have the American Eagle looking up here at the girl with the Statue of Liberty hat um, partying. And originally I had no flames on this, but then when all the riots and stuff started happening, I chose to put flames on it and like make it more of like a, um, yeah, and the, yeah, just like show more of what chaos was kind of coming about. So that's this this particular panel. This is a six foot by four foot panel. This is the largest in the series. And you'll notice that some of the colors are very similar to the colors from Sexy Loud. And that's only because I was kind of limited in terms of, I, you know, when COVID first hit, I didn't think I could go to the paint store at first. So, and of course you still could, but like, I didn't think I was going to be able to. So I was like looking at what I had on uh, in stock, you know, and like what I could use. And so that's why I ended up like using a lot of um, the same colors. I did, however, decide to use this blue and uh, specifically this pink. And the reason being is I was thinking 
of the blue that like a lot of our frontline workers are wearing, like doctors, et cetera. And then I was thinking about the pink from the fact that in March, when the first wave of COVID hit, there were the cherry blossoms that were blooming. So in this piece too, I um, obviously this is like a trunk here. And then behind him, I originally didn't have like these little um, statues. And then when all the statues were becoming highlighted in the news, I then decided to integrate um, statues in here that were um, being, you know, a focal point. And then this up here in the upper right hand corner is uh, George Washington upside down and sort of, you know, the spotlight on like what's going on. The US is kind of turning upside down right now. And then as we progress back to the bed, uh, anybody who's from New Mexico might notice I have an O'Keefe back here feature. And I, uh, and I wanted to just highlight sort of, again, just the absurdity of our culture. And then in the very back, you'll notice these trees and then the Portland stag. And so when Portland started to become more predominant on the news, I chose to put in the stag and the trees, but they weren't originally part of this, uh, this piece. They just sort of decided to come into it after that happened. And then this here is uh, at the same size. So these are, uh, I guess, like around four feet by three feet, something in that bracket. And uh, this work originally too, when I created this Biden piece, I actually didn't do this intentionally. I didn't realize that I had done like the Washington Monument and, as his body. <laughs> I, I had the like eagle thing going on and was like aware that I was drawing eagle, you know, uh, feathers, but when uh, it just happened that that shape sort of occurred there. I often get asked, what is Obama doing with a rainbow in his mouth? And I don't know. Um, it's either coming out or it's he's eating it. And I'm not sure, but I had intentionally just placed Obama here because this was before Harris was picked. And Obama really has had Biden's back through all of this. So I wanted to showcase that. And, and then this woman back here is kind of, you know, just looking at the scene and just like, what is going on in this, in this world right now? And just an observer of it. And then this man up here is depicting a lot of the people who are like suffering during this time. And it's been really tough. And yeah, and my, and my hope in doing this work was not to, you know, basically it was just to kind of lay the land and show what I had heard and experienced through the media during this time. So that ends my little mini Prezi. Um, does anybody have any questions? Nobody? Okay. <laughs> I have a question. Sure. On your on your going eight to ten hours with earplugs in, uh, what uh, what was the impact or what? How'd that affect you? Um, for me, it was that I felt like I could uh, make decisions quicker. Uh, like I could I could sense what I needed to do more rapidly in terms of just picking up on things. If that makes sense, um, like visuals, like oh okay, this is my next move. Um, almost like I could, I could just hear that and feel that more acutely. Just fewer distractions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot fewer. Just like yeah. Anybody else? I have a question. Oh. How do you how do you measure success with your works? Is that coming from some kind of internal measure or external measure or combination? Um, I I think it's internal for sure. I think you know, as a creator, that's really like primarily what you can do because it's such a subjective form that other people will have their own interpretations of it always uh, for better or for worse. Did that answer your question, Tyler? Okay. Dad, you had had your hand up. I did, I still do. Uh, so your COVID rainbows this recent work that you just described is a 
way that you've used, like, as I understand it, to synthesize your sort of view of the way the world has been in the last many months of, of, of disruption. Mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, I think back to uh, uh, something you once described as, and it, may, it might be back to the time when you're wearing earplugs and, and setting, you know, the world, putting the world aside, uh, as a time when you are in your studio and that is when you feel most centered. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you combine, do you combine those things now in a way that, where you're not necessarily requiring absolute uh, uh, silence, or do you still require that as, as you try to do the integration? That's a complex question, Dad. <laughs> um, I would say that, uh, well, first, a lot of what I do now has become so heavily intuitive that I don't have to think as much. So I think in the beginning, when I was first wearing the earplugs a lot, like I needed that, like that super, super quiet because a lot of my process was still so fresh to me. Um, and then from a centered point, I would say that I still think of my studio as my centering place, regardless too of like what subject matter I'm working on. And I don't know if that is answers your question or if they're if I'm on base with what you were asking, Dad. I think that does. I think you are. Okay. Any other questions? A question. Yeah. Hey, Natalie. Hi, Tim Maya. Really, I'm blown away by your oof. It's unbelievable, and you're so prolific and so precise at the same time. It's pretty cool. Um, I really was fascinated, especially in the instinctive feast, instinctual feast which is one of my favorite of your series, that you wove, a, you sort of waved us away from reading it allegorically when it seems to just beg for that kind of a reading with all those components put in in that sort of quasi-classical way. So anyway, I just thought that was interesting. And is it really not allegorical somewhere deep in there? Totally. And then my other, but, but what I really wanna ask is your work is also strikes me as very psychological. And I wonder if you are aware of or have some sort of theory of mind that you bring, that you're bringing to this, that, this work. Can you reframe that question? I'm not sure what you mean. Well, it seems really like you're thinking about how the mind works. It seems psychological to me, like you're turning people inside out and you're, not, you're, you're doing hyper-realism, but you're actually showing their, their inner mm. desires or um, pains or weaknesses or... I, um, I mean, I'm definitely fascinated, obviously, by the human condition. And that to me is really important. And, you know, for example, with the COVID series, I was just really sad, actually, when COVID first hit and, and wanting a way to somehow process through all of that, as well as maybe help other people process through it. Um, and I never really have thought about my work in that way, Natalie, in terms of it, whether or not I'm looking at it from a, a, you know, unraveling or opening of a person, you know, I, but the work is definitely confrontational. I mean, most of my figures and what makes it so confrontational is that typically uh, one of the figures will be like looking right at the viewer. And, and that's something that really, for like some people, like can totally jar them and throw them off. And moving back to the Instinctual Feast series, uh, it was it, like it was so not intentional. So much of it, <laughs> um, in fact, even the guy wearing the suit was that I was at school. Like I was doing my computer graphics program, and this somebody didn't show up to be my model. And one of these like other kids showed up, and he was wearing a suit. And I'm like, "Why are you in a suit?" And he goes, "Well, I literally this was the only clean clothes I had was this suit." <laughs> And so he wore that to school. And I said, well, would you model for me today? <laughs> and it just like happened that way. It was like not planned to have anybody wearing a suit in the work. He just like happened to be wearing a suit that day. <laughs> he was supposed to be a model. So there is like oftentimes just uh, an unintentional aspect. As I, especially as I progress forward, however, I've kind of 
digress, like gone back a little bit with the COVID series in regards to that, because the COVID one is so much more intentional than some of the other ones for sure. Uh, Tammy and Owen, you somebody had their hand up in there. I was just wondering how your studio time has changed since you've been at home more and in proximity and the news feed and being more intentional. Have, have you had long stretches of time in the studio or has that been kind of, how's that, I'm just curious how that's changed. Uh, you mean during COVID? Yeah. Uh, yeah, during COVID, actually I have uh, had less time in my studio um, because we've had the school still open and running and I've actually still had to go in even when we're doing online programming. So uh, I still have my two days a week. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Mary, you had your hand up. <laughs> and oh yeah. Hi Tan Maya. Hey. Um, I have a process question. Oh. So you talked you talked about adding things in that weren't there originally, like the trees and the stag, I think it was, whatever recent in one of your recent pieces and I'm just curious because your your um your surfaces are so incredibly um clean and pure in a way um if do you also take things out I mean it do you have a way of layering over or is that just impossible in the way you work and you have to be so right on when you create yeah. there's not much forgiveness I'll just say um mm -hmm. And I think it's because, so I always do the colored pencil work first and then the acrylic. So the stag was easy to put in because it was acrylic and I could just paint like easily on top of an acrylic surface. Uh -huh. And it was quite, it, it was more challenging from the perspective of like, if I had to put a colored pencil work in, then I would have had to sand down the surface mm -hmm. and integrate that differently. And are those, do you paint on panels? Uh, yeah, yeah, I paint on panel for sure. Um, I prefer hard surfaces to work on, but then uh -huh. they're really heavy and expensive to ship. <laughs> so. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, any other questions? So one more. Oh, yeah. Then, Maya, when, you, when you're talking about colored pencil versus acrylic, and you just said uh, in, in answer to that question that you start with trying to do the colored pencil. Has that, how has that changed for you? Where the, you know, in terms of what was you know done with originally you did oils and then you probably, I don't know, how did all that progress? And what do you most like working with now? Um, well, I mean, I, progress from oils to colored pencils, but I, I mean, I prefer working with colored pencils. It, I mean, I don't really understand, maybe I'm not understanding your question fully. Well, um, for example, uh, the, from your, from the uh, uh, um, thing that was at the Peters Gallery, your horse. Yeah. Which, which is a very lifelike, I mean, it's wonderful. I, that horse is so real to me. Um, it's, it's, um, the horse, I think, is all colored pencil, but around the horse, you know, there's the black, and that's that's a, that's that's a background you filled in later, or is that something? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it makes it more like like so from a process perspective. So if I was working, let's say, in oil, you know, you would do your background typically like first sometimes, and then you would do your element on top of that. But with colored pencil, I have to work with the colored pencil first and then everything has to be edged. So then like the horse, I had to go around it and do acrylic paint around it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And like, then blend it back in. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Price is on scale, so you work large, right? So you have like the larger panels and smaller panels. I, yeah. What's your attraction to the larger format? I, like. Well, I mean, colored pencil, I, I mean, I, so I use razor blades to like sharpen my colored pencils, but still like getting them that fine to do really small work is quite difficult. And, um, and then I just actually find larger work is much, 
like it's more fun to do and I feel more part of the process rather than removed. When I work on a smaller work, there's something I don't feel like I'm as engaged with it as I do a larger work. And the weird thing is when I'm working, like I rarely step back too. So, and that's usually because my studios are like really small, so I can't get very far back. <laughs> so I'm just like painting. And then you're like, oh, I wonder how this is gonna look in the end. And you don't really know. And I will even like sometimes have to take photos like with my phone of it in process. So I can even just get perspective because I'm so close to it all the time that I can't actually get that distance I need. But I love doing large works. I would do bigger, but they don't make panels larger, um, like as large as I want. <laughs> oh, and that's a problem for you to solve. Like, they don't you ship panels larger. What? They don't ship the large panels. Well, that becomes then it's like, well, how do you get wood big enough to make a crate to carry the panels? And yeah, it turns into a whole conundrum for sure. What are the panels made of? Uh, they're just MDF. Any Just other? Yeah. Tell us what that means. Oh, it's just that high density uh, board. Mike, what does it stand for? Medium density fiber board. And this is uh, <laughs> ultra light, which is a misnomer. And I use the ultra light, which is still not that light, but it's definitely a little lighter, but it's a little more papery than like a super normal MDF would be. It's, and it's not as heavy as plywood, right? Uh, uh, mm, close. I don't know, it's pretty close. They're both really heavy for sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, and then I spray, they're all sprayed in the end with like a really nice varnish. Uh, and that's like UV protected and everything um, just to seal the surface. And I don't do the spraying myself because it's so toxic. Yeah, Mike. Uh, what glue do you use for your glitter? And, and oh. I'm kind of curious as the process. I just use Maj Podge. I don't know what that is. It sounds <laughs> like a food. It's just like Elmer's glue, kind of. <laughs> what do you call it? Maj Podge. What's the Am name? I explain it? Am I like Selena, somebody? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Clear acrylic gel. It's like a clear acrylic gel. Mod Podge is the brand name. There you go. Family just like clear acrylic gel. That's what it is. <laughs> I found some uh, thicker sheets of what's called hardboard recently, like quarter inch thick hardboard. And that's a, that's an amazing material. Super flat. It's like sh it's like shiny almost. It's so flat. And, wow. and like MDF. Yeah. Oh, it's lightweight though. It's about the same weight. Oh. Yeah. I'm still trying to solve that one problem. Uh, anything else? Anybody else? How about a super thank you? We really appreciate it. Aw, well, thanks for everybody for coming. It's so nice to see all my family and friends. <laughs> oh, too much. Yes, Pam Maya, thank you so much for joining this as our featured artist. Your work is amazing. It's so great hearing about your practice. I'm so grateful for you being here. Oh, can I have, uh, Jen, do you want to chime in about the show that you're curating um, really quick and just let people know about that? Uh, sure. Um, the show opens February 2nd at the Shehalem Art Center, uh, sorry, Shehalem Cultural Center in... Newburgh, Oregon. So it's about an hour south of, of Portland. And it's all narrative paintings um, of, of like basically artists in the Portland area. And there's one from Seattle who's kind of linked to us as well. And the show's called Understanding Ourselves. So it, it's basically what Tan Maya was talking about is that how can we understand who we are as people through through the paintings that we make and through the stories that we tell about ourselves? Cool. Thanks. I think that we, that will actually have a Zoom opening, correct? I, I didn't I see that. No, I don't think we're going to do a Zoom opening. We may just get all the artists in the space, but there's still like 
capacity limits because of COVID-19. So it's only 35 people allowed in this rather large space. So it may just be us artists in there. Well, thank you. It's really going to be fun. And, and Jen does amazing work, uh, very narrative painting. Too, so it's, yeah, it's cool that you're here too. So, and you're, you're going to have your work in it, I'm assuming. Yeah, a couple. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, yeah. And then other than that, I think we're um, ready to wrap up. So thank you everybody again. Oh, so I want to like, what a treat. I just love seeing everybody on here. <laughs> Thank you, Ted Mayo. Thanks. Thank you much. Thank you. Lots of love to everybody across the country. Bye. 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 Thank you.